Hey, welcome to another, another episode of FCO This Week. I hope you enjoyed episode number 45, our last show, and we're looking forward to this one. This week, we're going to give you an interview and podcast version, and on the video, you can get that on, on iTunes or YouTube. Uh, and in that, we're going to talk to you and get a guy named, from Choosel and they'll show you how you can get into some media buying stuff, actually, for significantly less than what normal people were paying. Uh, we also look at a great list of articles, SEO tactics, content creation tools and tips, and some updates to some platforms that might be useful for you. All this and more on episode 46 of SEO This Week. <laughs> All right, so without further ado, we got a lot of sites to go through, and that interview is uh, pretty long. So I'm going to make this as quick and concise as possible, uh, just so you can scan through. We're going to do the sites first, and then you can get to the interview last, and that'll roll it up. So here we go. First is SEO Power Suite. There's four underrated SEO tactics that your competitors are using. To break out the list for you, it's optimized content for competitiveness. And then do add schema. Not a, not a lot of people are doing schema. As a matter of fact, you can go through the search results and see it for yourself. Tons of people are missing out on this. I don't get why they're not doing it. It's not that complicated, um, but for whatever reason, they're just missing it. They're not they're not taking taking advantage of it. Uh, crawl budget. This is a little bit more heady. If you are into this kind of stuff, basically you just want to make sure that the the bots can get around your site. Uh, in as much and easy as a way as possible. Obviously, there are going to be some things that you're going to block, but you know you want to go into crawl depth. You don't want you know every page should be at least no more than three clicks away from your homepage kind of thing. Uh, redirecting bad links, uh, fixing pages that are orphaned, duplicate pages, all that stuff. That all affects your crawl budget. And the easier it is for your website to be crawled, the more often Google is going to come back. That's basically the theory behind it. And then going social. It's kind of obvious, but, you know, add your social buttons on your website. Make sure they're working. Make sure they're highlighting your business, uh, if even if it's just a hashtag or something like that. So go ahead and take that uh, for what it is. It's a good article, just the four tips. Uh, it does leverage or show you how to leverage one of their tools. Uh, we use SEO Power Suite here at Digital Ear. And I think you'll like it. Next is brightlocal.com, and this is a post on uh, should air, SEOs guarantee the, their work. Basically, what this stems from is back in the day, people were sending out hundreds of emails. You know, I still get them today. We'll guarantee your rankings in in, uh, in Google. Well, it's easy to guarantee if I'm trying to rank for the best nerd in Se Seattle who does SEO. That's a nice long key string. I can guarantee you I'll rank it. But are you going to rank me for Seattle SEO, for instance? Probably not, because the competition's a little bit stiff. Uh, and the, that's the problem with these here, is because people are, are offering guarantees to business owners, well, they were, uh, in ranking, and they couldn't even get any, couldn't even get any on the first page, much less uh, rank number one in Google. And that turned into a position where business owners were getting smart and saying, look, if they don't own Google, how can they guarantee that they're going to rank in it? And they stopped and they use that now kind of as a disqualifier. So if you guarantee your rankings, all right, I'm next because I know you can't do it kind of thing. Uh, so now what we responsible agency owners do is they guarantee that they're going to provide you a service they're going to give you some sort of deliberal deliverables or our deliverable is the rank tracking sheet and an update on what we've done that month uh or you can get even more in depth where they can give you all of this stuff like here's all the links we built here's all the content we created for you all this stuff piled on really honestly in the end does it really matter to a business owner what matters is is the google recognizing what the SEO is doing and increasing the ranks over time. And that's what I think the guarantee should be, is that you're going to do your best. You're going to provide this information. I guarantee you're going to get this stuff on time. Uh, and that's how uh, we're going to service your accounts. It should be pretty simple. I, I think a lot of people guarantee, or agree with me. 52% of SEOs say that they shouldn't guarantee work. 19% say yes. Here's what a lot of those 19% guys are doing, though. They're 
going through and are saying, I will guarantee you that I will rank your page on your website on Google. Then they rank you for a stupid easy term that's not going to get you any traffic or any conversions. And then they bring you into a, a monthly thing. So honestly, I still use it. If I get, if a service provider says they guarantee me anything in relations to rankings, then I just move on to the next service provider. Don't want anything to do with you because you're kind of underhanded. There is some things that people say under some circumstances, I'll guarantee it. Honestly, I think it's pretty cut and dry. No SEO can guarantee that they will rank you uh, in Google. It's just the way it is. There are SEOs who are much better than other SEOs who have significantly higher track records. Um, so I would seek those people out versus seeing seeking people out who guarantee rankings. Next one is a uh, user submission is Spiralytics. Uh, they actually submitted like five, ten articles. A lot of them were a little bit older. We found this one on the site, and it's actually pretty good. And why you should evaluate your Facebook content strategy. Uh, some tips in here is to understand your audience, to know what the content is performing, uh, what content is performing, getting likes and being shared, to formulate new content ideas, to make and to make your goals a little bit more realistic. I think this is valuable because a lot of the problem with uh, marketers is we get a little bit of hypey and we guarantee this wonderful, you know, audience grow, build your audience on Facebook and, you know, shiny fairy dust will fall down. You'll get tons of traffic, tons of shares and people will love you, but it's not the case. Uh, you, there's always work involved and a lot of marketers kind of miss that out. So there's four easy tips that you can do just to kind of, if you're kind of doing this yourself and wondering why you're not getting a lot of trash traffic. Uh, another thing I like to add on to that is look at your competitors. What are they doing? What are they publishing? Don't go out and post the same exact thing. Make it, tweak it up a little bit to make it yours and then test it out. Then try it, maybe even add it in the ad campaign where you target their page with your new thing. See if it catches on. If it catches on, then you know you're on the right track uh, and you're kind of modeling them in the right way. So try that out. Uh, Razor Social content curation t tools, a curated list of uh, content curation tools. This is pretty good. We use uh, on our site. We use Listening Engine with Curation Suite. Uh, it's a WordPress plugin that helps us build SEO. This week we use it on our. I use it on my personal blog. Um, it's a great tool, uh, and there's some other great tools in here. Scoop it, Storyfy, Curata, Triber, Anders Link. I actually use Triber before. That's actually pretty good if you want to get social signals too. Don't just look at it as a curation tool. Look at it as real people sharing real content on uh, real accounts. Before it was a little bit shady whether these accounts are real or not. So. Um, but I did get traffic from it. So, you know, check out Triber. It's a good thing. Anders Pink is another that's interesting. And I haven't heard of that one before. Content Gems, haven't heard of that one. And Feedly, I've used Pocket uh, Drum Up, I've not heard before. Flipboard. So, there's, you know, some options here for you. It just depends on, you know, what you are looking for. Uh, Buzzsumo Age and Ahrefs both have uh, tools as well. So, check that out. Next one is Search Engine Journal, five ways to boost your SEO with third-party review sites. Basically, here's what it goes on to. You're going to create citations on Yelp, uh, let's see, Yelp, Yellow Pages, what other ones, Bing, Yahoo, those are all citations. Uh, what they're saying is use these to, to boost your SEO. Obviously, if you created the citations, you already have done one of the main things is you want to boost add your relevancy your name address phone number your nap as it's called uh to help with rankings you get the backlinks off the citation sites which establishes you inside of the area especially for local businesses a lot of people miss out on is the fact that you can rank these things so we rank in for our clients particularly for the brand name so we rank the website for the brand name then all of their citation sites including uh the yelps and all that stuff facebook and twitter then we look at their keywords. Now, if their keywords have a Yelp listing for a specific business, that is party on for us. What we do is go in there, reverse engineer what they did, and apply that to our client's citation sites, and then rank those for the keyword as well. So you have um, multiple touch points where you search for any business, and it's got the client site, uh, and then three or four citation sites. Now, if you see that in a search results, you're like, all right, this guy is the one we want. 
so try that out use that to boost some other ways that they throw in here is semantic search and how that relates to voice search and legitimacy content development and site traffic all for seo purposes voice search you know i've already gone ahead and said it right you know it's just asking questions it's you know and it doesn't guarantee that you're going to get uh, traffic from it but, but on mobile it does work kind of if this Stupid tools can actually understand what you're saying uh, when you're doing it. But, you know, uh, honestly, uh, the rest of the stuff is actually pretty good. Uh, check it out. Staying on Search Engine Journal is how to create sexy, interesting content for your boring industry. Uh, I don't know. I probably would have liked to see this from someone with a little bit more imagination. However, they, they take a controversial opinion, position on something. Be careful with this. It is your brand. And if you take a controversial opinion that pisses enough people off, your brand is going to have some problems. So while it does work, just be very careful when you're doing that one. Uh, incorporate tangible topics like backyard entertainment, pool maintenance, grilling outdoor tips, outdoor pest control. Uh, compile unique, useful data. I like data. I'm a data nut, so making charts and graphs and visualizations that's works awesome. Interview industry leaders. That's probably the best one because this what does it do? Let's say you are a plumber. Yeah, you interview other plumbers who maybe maybe they're doing another technique that you think is cool and they caught you. So interview them. Interview your suppliers. Get with them, so then your suppliers are now promoting you because you're promoting them. Get it? Uh, and interview. You know other people who are industry leaders in your in your niche. Obviously, it depends on depending on the niche you're gonna have. It's gonna be easier to find quote unquote leaders uh, versus some others. You just have to use your imagination, and then do case studies. Case studies is kind of a go to thing if you go through it. And then the other one, the last one, that probably should be on here is curated content. Uh, Blumenthal's Google My Business expands optional URLs for appointments, reservations, and ordering. In short, now some markets can already do it, but you can add an appointment URL. So what we're going to do is add, as soon as it's available to us, we'll make an appointment URL so you can make an appointment with us and we'll do your site audit. We do site audit videos, by the way. But we'll do your site audit right there live with you during your appointment and you don't have to wait for the video and you can talk to us while we're doing it. Pretty cool. We're, that's how we're going to leverage that. Uh, if you're a restaurant, you're going to be able to do menus, uh, add on or reserve a table. Uh, lawyers, doctors, and everything, you kind of leverage that appointment thing. Uh, there's reservations and an order online, order ahead URL. So I don't know, you're going to have a, a dinner at this place and you always have it. And uh, you can order that ahead and then show up at your reservation time with the foods already ordered. And you're already going in, out, boom. Bob's your uncle. So pretty good options here. Uh, check it out. Then check your Google listings and see if it's turned on for you. This is a post from HubSpot. It's on how to write a press release. Uh, there is a template you can download in the third paragraph. You just click on that and sign there. Fill out their 400 options box form. I don't know how an agency that's so smart as HubSpot makes it form the opt-in form that that's is that horrible but hey i guess it works for them uh and then how to actually write the press release what i want to go in here with this and say is everyone has a reason to write a press release signed up with a new customer who's a big customer there's a press release uh so hired a new digital marketing agency there's a press release for you i know it because we do it for every one of our clients new product new service new employees um Gave some money to a charity. All that stuff is a press release for you. Uh, so take advantage of press releases. Check out this article. We have a press release service over at Digital Ear. You got two options. We can post it to 3,000 people. And most of those are all manually edited. And that's for like a, your really good press release. And then you get some really good links out of that. Or we have the SEO press releases, which probably what everyone is doing now. Anyway, so you get the two options. We can write them for you. You can write them for you. So check it out on the site, digitalear.com under press releases. Uh, but they, this article is pretty good. What you get is uh, some headline tips. Um, don't play hard to get offering temp templating quotables, tempting quotables, put some cool guy quotes in there to get people to write about you, all that stuff. Here's the thing. Nine times out of 10, your press release is only going to get you some backlink value. 
and not going to get you any traffic, etc. Unless so you're, you know, start doing something really super cool, uh, and it gets picked up. It's pretty much along the lines of like viral traffic. They might see it, they might not. But if anything, you're going to get some backlinks out of it. So make this a standard practice for your link building. Search Engine Journal is Google AdWords made a couple changes. Uh, one of them, and mainly it applies to uh, mobile marketing. But there's a, a site links carousel. Basically, you know, you had an ad and then you could put your about page, contact us page, and maybe a couple of your services pages. And it would show the link in your ad. Now that thing moves inside of the... Um, search results on mobile that's pretty cool and then call outs and snippets they change the way those display too really honestly users maybe it you'll find it a little bit more valuable i don't know if you have to kind of get used to that call out the site snippet carousel if it's even going to be valuable as a marketing tool i don't know obviously they tested it i'm sure somewhere and it showed that it was so we'll see how that turns out uh, for marketers in the end, just turn it on. Maybe you'll get a click out of it. Maybe you won't. Then, but who cares? You're already paying for the ad, right? Um, next is how to find your competitor's backlinks. And then it says next level. I ain't going to go next level now because this thing is using Open Site Explorer. Open Site Explorer's link deposit repository is actually pretty lacking. Um, but you can get a lot of decent links. What I found, if I want to know just the authority links, like the really good links, you go to Open Site Explorer because it really only scans the good, good or quote unquote the good sites. Um, but you will miss out on a lot of backlinks that your competitors have if you're relying only on Open Site Explorer. That said, this process can be actually taken and used uh, pretty much any tool. We recommend Ahrefs for this. Um, you can do the same process on Ahrefs. Check this article out. Just go through. Basically, the, the skinny of it is put your competitor's URL in it. Look at their backlinks. Find the ones that you want. Download the report. And then go out to those same sites and say, hey, can, I, can you link to me too? Um, it's really that simple. Next is SEM Rush and social media trends that are transforming the digital marketing landscape. Inferial, ep ephemeral content, whatever. Basically, what it means is, you know, on Snapchat or Instagram, and you make those stories and they'll go away within 24 hours. That's what this content is. Uh, and people are leveraging it supposedly to make you know, a lot of traffic and sales. I think this stuff kind of plays a lot more to physical products and things that you can tangibly put your hands on uh, than services like a dentist plumber and probably an seo agency is not going to go in there and enter these things out not really all that many people are going to be interested in it especially considering the market uh, you know who's using these sites and who's using these tools but you know if you're a fashion site then knock it out try that out mobile first duh uh, augmented reality what they're saying here is, you know, these filters and stuff that are going on to the apps. Now, Facebook's even added those to you. You can write checks and make pretty faces and all that kind of stuff on your images to kind of enhance them out. That's a social trend right now. And then uh, live. Live on mobile. Facebook, Twitter. Uh, I'm not sure if Twitter, but, but Periscope, you know, that I think that thing's still around. Uh, but in using those and then the messaging apps are actually kicking off but a lot a lot more advertising inside of those now facebook's doing a good job of it and so is whatsapp uh, so i would check those out as opportunities for you maybe just to try and see if it's going to do anything you invest 100 200 bucks here and there and, and see what happens this satisfy our inner nerd. It's on uh, conversionxl.com. It's 2017 state of the industry report, conversion optimization. Basically, just goes into a lot of data. If you're interested, not in conversion optimization, but maybe it is a job or a career path, I'll just show you some interesting things like only 25% are female, the demographics, their average of 34 years old mostly in the united states they're not making as much money as they did last year but if you're in australia you're killing it on almost ninety thousand dollars a year and they said the industry is still young i don't you know honestly i don't get it everybody should be doing conversion optimization this should not be something that's young you you're testing ads and you're doing this over and over and over again 
uh, in different method, methods. And I think people are just kind of getting on, like business owners becoming more savvy into it uh, than uh, it used to be just kind of a, a marketer's only kind of thing. And now business owners are carrying into it and they're seeking out specific people for conversion rate optimization. So um, I check this out. It's pretty good. Again, if you're a data heads kind of guy, if you want to know how to do a piece of content using data, uh, this, this is a good example as well. Next, we're going to PPC Hero. It's the uh, the PPC puzzle, a checklist. This is really good. What I would do is take the tabs here, create yourself a little, literally a checkbox, uh, one sheet piece of paper, tell you what to do, and then print that out for each one of your clients. And there you go. You know what you're going to do daily, weekly, uh, biweekly, and monthly to maintain a AdWords account. Um, it's really that simple that's a it's a good checklist to do and then finally a portent stamp your ppc ad copy you know those little register registered and then uh, copyright or trademark if you do those if you have those set up put those in your ads and see what your click through rate does they claim that they went from 3.5 percent to over 10 percent in click through rate just by adding that little those little dealies so um, why not try it? I think it's going to be just like anything else, though. A lot of people are going to catch on. They're going to use it, and then it's going to burn out, kind of blind, and it's going to lose its value. So, um, But again, something to test. Throw it in one, make a copy of one of your ads, add that to your brand name, the trademark or the copyright or the registered, and then um, see what happens. Okay, that's it for the articles. Now we're going to move on to the interview. Again, the interview is pretty long a little bit over an hour but it's great you're going to hear kyle roof from the search intelligence association or agency they're getting ready to rebrand um that is a great organization that i'm in personally involved in and we test test and test some more uh single very option uh results as a result of you know what is moving and what's not moving the needle in search engine optimization so you should check out the sia check out choosel for digital media buys, and basically you're going to put ads on other websites. Big websites you never even thought you had an option to do. You can drop two, three, four hundred bucks in this thing, and you'd be on CNN, AOL.com, and all that other stuff competing with the big boys without the big boy budget. So with that said, let's listen to the interview with Chuzel, and I'll see you next week for episode number 47 on SEO this week. I hope you enjoy episode number 46, and have a great week. Hey everyone, welcome to Tuesday Chats with Kyle. It is Tuesday, I'm Kyle. We are live. With me as always is Clint. Clint, how are you doing? I am doing wonderful, how are you? I'm doing great, thanks. How is life at your end of the world? It's good, I finally published the uh, on-page SEO guide I was working on. Uh, I saw that. 9,000 words of joy and goodness, so. See how that works out. It takes, it's got some good traffic, so we'll see. Yeah, like, so how long has it been live? Uh, did it both today or was that last night? I did it yesterday evening so I can get a little bit of traffic to make sure that that mini funnel that I built was working, so. Okay. Um, and how have you boosted that? So you boosted, uh, did you do like a boosted post on Facebook or are you just kind of doing it through your normal channels? Uh, right now, just normal channels, but the intent is to actually throw some uh, test out some Reddit ads and Twitter ads with it. See what happens. Okay. What's the response so far? Uh, people are liking it. Uh, and the opt-in rate is pretty decent. Uh, I would like to see a little bit better, but I think the ads and I do some persona uh, work on some of the uh, SEO type sites like inbound.org and share it there and see if I can get some more traction out of it. So I was able to see an advanced copy of this, and for those that aren't familiar or haven't seen it yet, uh, Clint did a, a very comprehensive on-page optimization guide, and it's really nicely done because it kind of it it it's as step by step as on on these things I think you can be, um, but it goes through uh, some technical considerations into uh, keyword research considerations into a bunch of other things, and then actually what should go on the page. Um, I think it's excellent. Uh, who would Clint? Who would you say is the ideal person for that? Who should 
who should check it out? Probably uh, newbies who have a basic understanding of what I'm talking about when I say title tags, meta tags, and that other stuff. And then um, I'd even – like my mastermind guys are handing it out to their VAs when they want to – you know, create their pilot, their SOPs and stuff. They're just using that guide now. Um, that I think is actually a really great use of it for those that are agency level guys and gals. Um, it's the kind of thing that I think you can give your VA and then you can work it into whatever your process is. But at a minimum, it would be a, a learning point or a jumping off point for your team. Um, where can people get this, Clint? Uh, you can get over on the uh, on digitalear.com. It's in the, under uh, the blog. You can find it there. And it's on the ticker right now, too. So. Very cool. And if you're in the Skype group, the SIA Skype group or the Facebook group, you can always ping Clint and he can help you out there if you're having problems. Yep, so right. today's a good day. We have a special guest, Mark McCabe from Choosel.com. And I stole this next paragraph from the footer. Choosel provides a programmatic platform that leverages detailed consumer data to power real-time advertising campaigns across display, video, mobile, and social mediums, all from a single, simple interface. I do love marketing copy. Um, thank you very much, Mark, for being on. Thank you for having me, Kyle. I'm excited to uh, talk a little bit about search and talk a little bit about how display and how it, uh, how it can tie in. Fantastic. So uh, both Clint and I met Mark at SMX. Uh, a little background, Mark was very sad and lonely walking around all the display booths and at the SIA booth, we adopted him and brought him in, got him a clean pair of clothes, some food, <laughs> and, sent, and sent him on his way. It was a lot of fun. You guys had a, a beacon of light. It was a big bottle of, uh, of rum, I think it was. <laughs> and we all got to, uh, to hang <laughs> it out it, and, and chat over a few cocktails. Exactly. It could have been that you wanted to uh, be our friends or you just wanted the booze. Probably, probably <laughs> the booze. No, it was good. But, um, Mark, really what cool we'll do – oh, well, thank you. That was all Dory. If um, if anybody's ever seen the pictures, that was all Dory and Meredith. They did an amazing job. I just kind of showed up with the booze, and I was like, let's do this. <laughs> um, Clint, if you'd like to make Mark the presenter, Mark, we can jump right in, and we can see what Choosel is all about. Cool. Thanks, Hal. Uh, I think I'll have – the screen shared here in a second. Um, but what I thought would be helpful today was just when I went to SMX, I learned a lot about what I didn't know, and I don't know a ton about search. Um, Choosel is a programmatic platform that allows agencies and brands to advertise online. And what we'll kind of discover today is um, what display advertising is. And people will throw around the, the term programmatic, so I thought we would unpack that term a little bit and talk about what programmatic advertising is and how agencies can use it to reach an audience online. And typically, when done well, those ads will spark people's interest, let them know about a new brand, let them know about something that they didn't know about previously, and then increase search and increase overall traffic. Can you guys see my screen okay? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, we can. Perfect. So probably what we'll do in a second here, we'll just take a quick look at our demo and, and our platform, and you guys can ask some questions as I kind of show some things. Um, but just maybe to help kick it off, um, maybe a little programmatic history or what digital advertising looks like from a, from a display standpoint. So we used to go to, let's say, CNN.com and say, hey, I'm advertising for Nike shoes. I want to show my, my shoes or my ads on CNN.com. And that would be what's called a site direct buy. You have to do a lot of work. And then if you wanted to show up on other sites, you would have to plan on those sites as well. But now programmatic is basically just technology that allows us to bid on and show my ads on many different sites. So really I can, I can focus on faces and not places. I can say, I want to hit a female who's 18 to 35, who drives a minivan, who has three kids in household, and who shows an affinity to liking um, adventure travel, whatever that might be. We can build that audience based off online profiles and then follow her around and serve her ads as she shows up on CNN.com or whatever site might be.com. And that's what basically programmatic is. It's real-time bidding to show advertising online. 
and how that works is you guys might notice as you read different news sites or browse different websites, um, products that you've searched for or products that you've browsed, they might start following you around. And that's what's called retargeting. And those retargeting ads show up because um, as you load the page, all within a split second, there's a lot of things going on. There's actually an auction that takes place. So the site might recognize that cookie number 4692 is loading this page. But who knows something about cookie number 4692? They go out to the machine. The machine says, who knows something about this cookie? Um, Chusel or people in our same, similar space will say, oh, I recognize that cookie. Um, he's 34. He does this. He searches for this. He kind of shows us this profile. And based on our data partnerships, we can verify that. And then we'll say, I want to pay a 50 cent CPM to make sure I show that person my ad. And then, you know, five, 10, 20 other entities similar to Chusel will be doing the same thing based off what they know on this cookie and what they can bid. And their technology will say, well, I'm pretty cool. I'm pretty, pretty savvy about this guy. I really want him. I'm going to pay a dollar to show him an ad or dollar CPM cost per thousand impressions. Um, if they win that bid, their ad shows up. And then, of course, all of our tracking and reporting will show that we won that bid for whatever that rate was, and we showed the ad. And hopefully that person maybe clicked on it. If they did, then we can track that person to the site and then follow them around from there. If they didn't, in the very least, we know they saw the ad. And if they showed up on the site, we can then say they viewed the ad on Thursday and then came to the, ad on, uh, I'm sorry, came to the site on Friday. Kind of a lot there. Kyle, does that raise any questions so far before I move on? So far, so good. I mean, just a quick recap. The idea is that it's a platform that uh, you can put in um, what kind of demographics you're looking for, and then when somebody hits a site and they know what those demographics are, if uh, it kind of relays back to Chusel and some other platforms, and then Chusel can fire off an ad on your behalf to target somebody that you're looking to get in front of. Uh, generally speaking, I would guess these are display ads meaning that they're going inside content, so it's not like a search ad, for example. That's right. So when we talk about display, digital display advertising via real-time bidding, we're usually talking about the 300 by 250s that you know are uh, the square ad on the side of CNN, or that big leaderboard, that, that big banner that goes on top, that's uh, a common uh, creative size as well. Um, yeah. Right on. And, Speaking about how this kind of works with search, we think about the marketing funnel. So display kind of sits up top. We want to make sure that we can serve ads to people that fit a certain profile to let them know about our client's brand or let them know whatever message we want them to know about. Um, further down the funnel, as you get closer to the conversion, we think about how else can we hit these people. And search comes in down towards the bottom there. You're making sure that when somebody's searching, that your message shows up. And display kind of fits into that to say, we want them to know about your message before they search for it. And that's where we live. And then also we do retargeting, which is listed here as remarketing, which is to say, we can track the people that come to your site and then follow them around and keep showing them your impressions to make sure that they're familiar and that they, can, they, they know they left something in the cart and they can go convert. So that's, that's where we come in. We're a platform that has technology that goes out to these real-time bidding exchanges that allow you to set bids, similar to how you would set bids for search, but you set bids for winning display impressions that include also video. We also have native uh, placements available in the platform. Um, but all this is under one roof to help you track, understand an audience, and serve ads across the exchanges and learn where your ads are being served. So if you want to bid up on sites like Forbes.com, for example, you can bid up there and you can make sure you're showing ads there. Really, that's that's it for a little bit of a, a 101 about what programmatic advertising is. Sure. So when you think about, um, I can do this through AdWords. I can do display marketing. I can do remarketing through AdWords. Why shouldn't I just use that? Why should I use Chusel? Sure. That's a great question. It's commonly asked. Um, people are in search a lot, I'm sorry, in Google a lot when they're doing search, so, so why not just, you know, give them some more money to put display ads out there. Um, what Chusel is, is a, is a demand side platform, and the reason why other demand side platforms exist is because we have additional data 
made available by site, places like Oracle um, and other sites that, that collect and, and sell data. We have access to all the websites that take place in real-time bidding, which means they don't have to necessarily be on the Google Display Network. Um, we can use more data than, than what Google has made, made available to GDN and AdWords, and we have access to more sites that take place in real-time bidding than um, just the, the sites that are on the Google Display Network. And I would also say, and I don't mean to <clears throat> lob softballs, but um, something that we've talked about is how easy it is to lose money on Google through wasted click. I think that's yeah, probably... they do make it very easy to spend money on their platform. Um, oh, I want to hit you know, people that show up on these sites. Here you go. Let's, let's go. Uh, I think what, what our platform will add to that is let's, let's bring a whole data layer in and, and talk about the types of audiences that you want to target. And then we'll also provide in-depth reporting to show you exactly where uh, your impressions are being served, what the bids are won at, um, and really track through how people are, are interacting with your ads. We've so you just touched on um, what maybe the difference between Google's platform is. Uh, are you familiar with something like Site Scout? Is that one yeah, of your competitors? You know, I think Site Scout was purchased by Centro. Is that right? That so I don't know. We all we all kind of play in the same space, and you know, one thing that that agencies might become very familiar with is that there are a lot of companies in this space that all offer the best targeting and they all offer the best inventory. And what we believe it's kind of become commoditized. So DSPs all, for the most part, have access to similar amounts of data that, that, that are made available out there as long as you can partner with those companies. And as long as you have the technology to, to have a seat on the, the exchanges, you, you kind of have the same available inventory. And, and that, that sounds like I'm shooting myself in the foot there, but um, if that has become commoditized, then who do you want to work with? What partner do you want to work with in order to put programmatic ads out there? And we believe it's the one that's the easiest to use, um, that has a UI that, that makes it very simple to put ads out there, but then also comes with support. If you ever have any questions, you can very easily either, you know, submit a ticket or if you, um, work with us as a strategic account, then you'd have access to somebody just to call and say, hey, what's going on with my campaigns? We'll make it very easy to work with somebody. Um, and that's really it. So we don't charge minimums or require any contracts. So the, the people that might not have access to huge trading desks out there might start with Chusel and say, let's start here. Let's learn about our audience. Let's learn about programmatic advertising um, and really leverage our technology uh, that's almost enterprise level that hasn't really been made available to smaller agencies in the past. So would you, would you say it's fair to say that this would be something where um, if you had a, maybe you had that $5,000 to commit, but choose will be the situation where you could spend a hundred of that or 200 of that and really figure out your audience. Yeah, that's exactly right. And so we'll show here in the demo how we can target audiences and how we can use insights to, to look at how we can target an audience. Um, if you go to, to some other players in this space and say, I want to hit moms that drive minivans in Boise, Idaho, they might say, well, that's great, but like, we don't have the ability to do that. You're going to have to open up your, your audience. You're going to have to hit somebody on a, on a nationwide scale. And the reason for that is because as a managed service, they need to have something that's like at least 10000 or at least $20,000 per month uh, to pay their bills and to keep the lights on for them. Whereas for us, we really develop this easy to use platform that makes it available and easy for somebody to build a $200 or a $500 campaign to hit that mom in Boise, Idaho. That's a point that I'd really like to drive home and why I wanted you to come on the, on the program and talk about it. Cause I think a lot of the people listening are um, kind of that medium sized agency or, or a lot of solo practitioners. Um, this is an opportunity where uh, you don't have to have that five to $10,000 range where you could actually come in with a hundred dollar kind of campaign, which in my mind, and I have very limited knowledge of programmatic bidding, but in my mind, that's a huge differentiator here, is you can actually do micro campaigns. That's right. And we don't limit, you know, what's available to them with small campaigns. We still bring enterprise level technology to the table when it, when it comes to even small campaigns. And I think that's what sets us apart.
Very cool. Go ahead and you, uh, why don't you show us the demo you've got. <clears throat> cool. So this is the platform. There's a lot of different ways to show you all what we do, but I'd like to just keep it simple. Um, we can begin with just thinking of what Chuzel is. We're, we're a programmatic platform. We provide uh, managed services for those people who do have a, a decent budget to spend and they don't want to pull the, the, the levers themselves. We have self-service availability so that people can do it themselves and save money and save time and just do it themselves. And then we have insights. So when we work with an agency, they typically uh, send our site pixels to their clients so that we can start tracking everything that's going on their page. That way, when we start advertising, we can use those pixels to retarget site visitors. We can also use those pixels to pull customer insights from who's coming to their site. So without getting into too much detail, we, we kind of run this through our data providers and we say, for example, for the Choosel.com site, we're a B2B site, obviously, so we have a B2B type audience. But the last 60 days, we've tracked 14,000 different people that have come to our site. And because we can kind of match up their cookie profiles to our data providers, with some certainty, we can recognize that we're skewing high for females, just over 50%. Um, based on Experian data, we skew older. Based on, you know, net prospects data, people work in um, business services. And this all makes sense for a B2B platform. This would be very different if we were a retail site. We'd kind of learn different insights about who's coming to the site. But just to show you guys how this is actionable, um, let's say, you know, based on SIC codes, we're skewing very high against the Internet average with people that work in business services. And here's that summary here. We have a potential reach to hit. 492 other million people in the U.S. that work in business services. So let's include this in building a custom audience based off of the, the insights from what we see here. And I'm sorry, Mark, what are and SIC codes? I think uh, that's a good question. So SIC codes, I think, denote the type of business, uh, the type of company that somebody works in. And so basically, one of our data providers has scraped the Internet, has scraped databases to understand where people work. They make that data available through our data management platform in our system. Um, might have to Google that in the background and see what SIC codes are, but it's a great way to understand uh, where people work. I think it might be standard industry classification. There we go. Um, th those classifications are made available on our platform, and you can use those classifications to, to target an audience. Very cool. Um, and then Net Prospects is another company that sells their data. And we trend high for people that work in small business. So let's include them into our little audience builder here. And then let's say, you know, I want to serve my ads to media planners that sometimes can be female, for example. And this, I'm just making this up, so don't, don't sue me for saying that. But now we have a potential reach of 300 million people that we can serve our ads to. That's because everybody's here in an or statement. But if I want to hit people that work in small businesses that are female, our reach goes down to about 4 million people, and we have a data CPM of 39%. So if the media clears at a dollar CPM, this bid, this bid would be won at a dollar 39 CPM. And maybe this is a little bit too in the weeds for a search audience. I apologize. But you can save this audience to say, let's, let's, hit, let's create a campaign to hit people that fit this profile when they're browsing online. We also have a section of our platform for first-party data. First-party data is if you've collected a list of IP addresses, you can serve at those IP addresses online. First-party data is retargeting, which means somebody visited your homepage or your shopping cart and you want to track them and find them again, you can actually do that via our platform, just like a company you guys might have heard called AdRoll. That capability is very easy in our platform. Also, CRM data. I think this is a popular ask amongst um, search advertisers. Here's an example of CRM targeting. So if you have you know, Salesforce as your CRM and you have, let's say, 5,000 email addresses of all of your best customers or 5,000 email addresses of all the people that have been to your site but haven't purchased or been active in the last 30, 60, 90 days, however you have your email addresses organized. 
you can send us through live ramp through this position that we have a, a partnership where we anonymize those email addresses and we actually match cookies. We match online profiles to those email addresses. And then we can target those people and serve them ads online because we were able to match their online persona with their email address. That strikes me as very Skynet. So the idea is that you can take somebody's email and match them to a persona. You think this is the actual person. That's right. <laughs> and then you can show them any ad you want. Yeah. That's amazing. So I agree. And so IP addresses too. So we, we advertise, you know, choose those services to say, Hey, like you're an advertising agency, check out Choosel. And the way we do that is we, we actually compile some addresses of digital advertising agencies. We uh, find the IP addresses of, you know, that building. And then we serve ads to the IP addresses that belong to that building. That's also unbelievable. And I'm, I'm looking at this and it says potential reach of under a thousand. So you're saying though, that even if it's an, ex an extremely small reach, the platform will still do that. If I want to just target in on something that could be under a thousand people, it'll do that for me. Correct. It's phenomenal. I mean, if like, I think about even just doing like outreach for my own clients, uh, I know where some of them live <laughs> in a sense of like their offices are here. I could start just advertising. Hey, Joe, <laughs> pick up the phone and call me. <laughs> you can put your face on a piece of creative and start serving it to that address. Sure. <laughs> that would be unbelievable. Is the data, um, that are the data points US only on the, uh, on the stuff they're doing or is it UK, Australia, worldwide? What, what can, what can you get? So we have global reach. Um, a lot of companies in my space struggle with China, but outside of that, we have global reach. Okay. So if somebody is sitting in the UK, they could run all the same kind of data points. Correct. Very cool. The one limitation there is, is what we're about to show. So we talked about how we can use insights to target an audience based off of what we know about current site visitors, uh, how we use first party data to build retargeting pools and how we use first party data to hit IP addresses. Um, next, we can target an audience based off third party data. So we have server to server integrations with over 65 data providers. And you guys might have recognized some of these, these partners here. Blue Kai is a big one. Bombora is another one. Um, Oracle Data Logics. They, Oracle actually tracks offline purchases. So if you want to serve ads to people who bought spicy Cheetos, you can do that through their data. Uh, Dun and Bradstreet, excellent B2B data. Edmunds. So if somebody goes to Edmunds.com, here I'll just kind of give you an example here of of what we can do with Edmunds data. So if you are Toyota and you want to serve conquesting ads to people that are visiting Nissan pages, you can do that through um, Edmunds data. So these 950,000 people estimated um, have been to Edmunds.com and visited pages for the Fiat 500e. And the cost per mil suggested bid is a buck seventy-five. That's right. So how that works is it gives you an idea of what you'll be paying for the data layer. So for example, if you create a campaign based off of retargeting, you're using your own first party data, there's no cost. If you buy Edmunds data, it's a dollar seventy-five on top of whatever the media clears for. So the average media clearance across the exchanges might be 50 cents, a dollar, a dollar fifty, cost per mil, cost per thousand impressions. Um, if that's a dollar clearance, it would be two dollar and seventy five cent cost per thousand impressions. And for those that aren't familiar with the term, when you say clearance, can you define that real quick? Sure. So give you a really fast example here. Um, this is an example of, of what's called a high definition report. We have 16 tabs here, tons and tons of data about where your ads are showing up, how people are interacting with different pieces of creative that you're serving, which one is, is getting more clicks, um, which piece of creative is, is tied to more conversions, how frequently are we serving ads to different cookies during the day. I won't go too much into detail here, but here's an example of um, us showing ads programmatically 
on Yahoo's mail client. Our system, our technology has bid on 1.8 million impressions. We've won uh, 29,000 of those impressions. Um, the win rate here is about 1.6%. We, we want to shoot for an 8 to 10% win rate. This is, again, too much information. Sorry, guys. Um, but the CPM here is $2.14. We're winning bids and paying, on average, $2.14 for a cost per thousand impressions. This data that we're looking at, is this the data that you would give a client, like this is the performance of your ads sort of a thing? Sure. And yeah. this is for people who like to dig into data. They want to know where their ads are showing up. They want to know what they're paying on a like a very in-depth level because a lot of programmatic providers don't give this much detail. They don't know where their money's being spent and they don't know, you know, are they showing up on time.com or are they showing up on coolmathgames.com? Uh, <laughs> so we give that transparency. So can I, help could I go through this list and be like, actually, I don't want to show up on half of these. I'd like to show up on these 10. Could I pull that out and then tell the system? So that's actually how we can help optimize your campaign. So if we're doing things as a managed service, we're actively using this list to help understand is somebody making it through? You know, we have pretty high standards and high filters set, but is like some, you know, crappy website.com showing up, we can add that to the blacklist. Okay. So yeah, so I could say I like these, I don't like these, and you could actually get a negative list of, of sites. That's right. And you can you can block them or you can actually separate them and let's say I want to show up on six different news sites. And if I were to go to those sites directly, they would charge a $20 to $30 CPM, cost per thousand impressions. If you show up there programmatically, you'll be spending a dollar, $2 or $3 for a programmatically served impression. So what we can do is we can actually create a whitelist and say, I want to show up on these five news sites and I want to pay anywhere between $1 and $6 CPM to serve ads there. And through the magic of the platform, you're able to track how many impressions are being won there. Should I increase my bids? But anyways, it's a technology that helps you show up on those sites without having to pay a site direct uh, CPM. How about this? In Facebook, there's a, a feature where you can create lookalike audiences where you've got, hey, these 5,000 people are, are my people. And then you can kind of put that into Facebook, and Facebook will then start matching up similarities and give you what's called a lookalike audience, where then it'll say, like, okay, you like that, those 5,000, check out these five, and it'll start running ads to those because the idea is that they're basically your audience as well. Is there anything similar to, to that kind of a feature in this? Yeah, that's a great question. Lookalike is very popular for prospecting. You think about digital advertising. You've got prospecting to try to get new people to be aware of your brand, to try to drive new people to your site and you've got retargeting to drive people back to your site. So prospecting is this, to try to reach a new audience based on what we know about people. But prospecting is also uh, using what you know about the internet at large and whether or not they're similar to your converters. Uh, one way, so Chuzel has two ways to build a lookalike audience. One way is to use the insights that we get from your client's site and if we were to dive in here and go to choosel.com forward slash convert, you know, conversion page, the people that have signed up, we could see the insights for the people that have signed up on our, on our page. And then we can say, oh, cool, you know, they're, they're highly likely buying certain kinds of apparel, whatever this data might be. Let's build an audience based off of the, the converters on our site because they look like the converters on our site. That's one way. Number two is you can upload data. So you can upload a list of email addresses or anyone, any kind of data that you have about your converting audience. And we can send that data to Oracle. Oracle has a product called uh, Modeling 360. So with all of Oracle's, you know, you mentioned Skynet earlier, that's a, that's a good comparison. Um, <laughs> they can match it against all of their data. Have you been they to the future, say, Mark? Right, basically. Just wait till you see the ads that are going to be served to you later on, Kyle. <laughs> um, they'll say, you know, based on all of our Oracle, Skynet, Mimes, we're going to match up profiles that, that very much look like the people that are, are converting with this much, you know, percentage of, of, uh, of lookalikeness to, 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 to this group of, you know, 5,000 additional people that look very much like your converters. So two ways to look alike audiences, both easy in the platform. 
Extremely cool. I saw on a previous screen you had um, job title, um, vice president, president. Could I even could I run an ad targeting the vice presidents at Microsoft? Sure. So we could uh, layer in. We could layer in, so let's say, presidents, you know, or any kind of job title that you might want. Um, based on the, the data we have available. Because of, you know, these things have to be kind of anonymized, if you will, so we wouldn't be able to say people that work at Microsoft. But if you had Microsoft's IP address, we can layer in Microsoft's IP address with the president layer and hit presidents at Microsoft. <laughs> it's like, well, we can't do it directly, but maybe we can do it. Right. There are ways, Kyle. There are ways. <laughs> Um, um, so the, unless, the question just a, somebody, a question just came. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, unless somebody has made it available, which I I doubt because there's a lot of, even though all this data is out there, there are still privacy laws in place that say we can't target specific people, we can't target, you know, people with cancer, for example, because of HIPAA laws. So that you know, all this amazing stuff, there is a caveat with privacy laws. So. Um, Take that into account. Sure. Uh, a question came in. So we're looking at all these filters that you've got. If I'm doing the non-managed, the, the self-managed, do I have access to all of this? So, so these filters here, we're talking about all this data that's available. Yeah. If if you have self-serve, you're the person in the in the platform doing this. If you're a managed service, um, which means you don't want to do this but you want to pay us 10% to do it, we will do it, and you'll still have access to the platform to see all the stuff we see and see what we're doing. So we can almost train you to become a self-serve, you know, basically an agency trading desk, people that do this. Uh, we even allow people to white label our service so that you can offer people self-serve and it looks like it's coming from you. Ah. <laughs> Run through that real quick. Sure. So. Um, Access to the Chuzel platform is $99 per month. That means with, with you know, month by month, there's no annual contract, there's no minimum. You just pay us the $99 a month and you get access to the software. And if you choose to create, you know, a $1,000 campaign, you'll get whatever that $1,000 buys you with in terms of the amount of impressions. And that is how you are a self-serve client of Chuzel, how you're building your own trading desk type of things in Chuzel. If you are an agency, call it like smithagency.com. And Smith has a bunch of clients that are interested in smaller self-serve campaigns. And Smith doesn't want to do the self-serve work themselves. They can become like basically a Chuzel Pro or Chuzel Summit um, client of Chuzel. And we can white label this and it would say Smith's agency instead of Chuzel. And Smith's clients can go in here and, and create targeted campaigns themselves and pay Smith to do that. And crazy. Smith in turn pays us the monthly fee, not $99, but at this point it's more in the $1,000 per month range to white label the Chuzel platform. But still, that's a, that's a very sexy thing that you can do. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Does, does, did that answer the, uh, let's see, the, yeah, self-serve, you can do this, and you have always access to the support center. So if you ever have any questions about what you're doing and how the platform works, you can say, you know, what's, what's CPM? What's, my, what's a win rate? What should a win rate be? And if this doesn't answer your question, you can just create a new support ticket and have somebody in the support center reach out to you within an hour. Very cool. A question came in earlier um, when you were talking about that you can match with um, uh, email addresses. Can you match with things like cell phone numbers? Nope. I okay. think that might draw the, some sort of line about privacy laws or something. <laughs> Stupid. But prince. there are device IDs. <laughs> there are device IDs. So, for example, we partner with a company called Factual and OnSpot. And if you want to hit the device IDs, the mobile device IDs of of cell phones that have been to the, let's say here in San Francisco, the Moscone Center. So maybe they're at Dreamforce, or maybe they're at 
some Google I.O. or they were at some conference and you want to hit all the mobile devices that went there, we can actually take that address or a radius around that address and hit all the mobile devices that were in that building on a certain date. That is nasty. So you could, if you wanted to advertise to everybody that went to SMX, you could then we, grab. Yes. <laughs> that is amazing. Yeah. So we, we can set we can set parameters. Anyone who's been to this address in the last 30 days, anyone who's been to this address on a certain date, um, and then we can match those device IDs, collect them into an audience, and then serve ads to that audience. Unreal. Because <laughs> and, and what, like I said, like you said before, you could put a picture of just yourself and be like, "Hey, this is me. Remember, we were at the conference." Yeah. You said you were going to call me drinking back. all of Kyle's booze. You saw me in the corner. <laughs> yeah. So that's an option. So there are, and, and one thing too that people are doing that's really cool with this is lots of advertisers are having difficulties, what we call attribution. They're having difficulties tracking to say, yeah, you know, I hit this really niche audience and I saw a lift in my, my branded search or I saw a lift in my organic traffic, but how do I know that they're coming to my store? Like, how do I know this is working at all? So what we're doing with location device IDs is we can set um, a location and say, did this mobile device, did any mobile device that saw an ad from us show up there? So Nissan, for example, might say, did anyone who saw my ads come to my, my dealership? And we can set that up as a convergent zone and say, yes, these people came. So our, our, that campaign was a success. If that makes sense. It's possible. I just came a little bit. So what we're, what you're saying for maybe that anybody that missed that is that, um, you run, uh, you could even run something offline. You know, you could run anything that, uh, I guess online would work, but the idea is that you can set, um, the office that they would be walking into the business they would walking into as a conversion zone. And you could see when they came, yep. I guess they didn't need to be online to get there and you could track it through. Yeah, and I'm not sure. So that's one of our partners that lives within our platform. Um, so I don't have, we would have to, you know, kind of dive in and, and discuss further how, how it all works. But basically true, and it's based off of device ID. So when that device ID hits that, that marker, um, we would know. A GPS hmm. location, so to speak. Um, and just, just to, to kind of tie this up here with, with our third-party data providers, it gets in depth so much as to so like if you create your kid's first birthday invitation on evite you might think like why is evite a free site what is this they're actually selling all that data so if we want to hit moms with kids in households so we know that because they just created a invite they have a kid between the ages of one to two because of the you know the parameters set on that invite and the same goes for people that are planning bachelorette parties or baby showers. So we can use that data to make sure we're targeting a certain person based on their, you know, what they're doing online. Extremely cool. And what's nice is that, I mean, you get access to this with a uh, hundred bucks a month, right? That's right. Once you, once you're a client of, of Chooser, you're using the platform, you don't have to build something, but you can get in here and start to strategize how you want to build something, whose data do you want to use, how niche can I get? And then you could put together and see, okay, you know, this stuff would cost me about a $3 CPM. Let's put it, let's put a hundred dollars against it or a thousand dollars against it and run a campaign and see how it performs. So let's, uh, and this is off the top of my head and I don't know anybody in this niche, but let's say I am in the med spa niche in Phoenix where would I start in the platform? Like, what would I do to start just to dive in? What's like step one? Sure. So step one is, is, a, is an option. You can look at the customer insights, the people that are coming to that MedSpa's website. Um, but if you decide not to turn those on because there's an additional fee to track those insights, if you decide not to turn those on, then you might know something about the people you're trying to hit. In what was the city again? Phoenix. So Phoenix. So you'd go to the general demographics 
and you choose Phoenix if you wanted to only serve in Phoenix, or you can do, you know, a zip code list of all the, the, the areas around Phoenix or the Phoenix DMA, wherever that is. And you, you'd start to like build out your audience. You can just do something very general, like uh, females ages 30 to 50, high household income, all of those general demographic data points, they're all automatically in here. You can just choose from those very easily and say, I want to hit there. Or when you're building the campaign, you can tell it to contextually advertise on sites that have to do with health and wellness, have to do with massages, have to do with like pampering or like fancy stuff. We can put that in and say, just serve ads there. Or you can really dig in to the third party data and start to really, you know, this, this takes a little bit of time, but like, let's see what blue guy has for spa. And this might be, Oh, <laughs> we have to set some parameters here to, to not say, let's, let's go after spa because we're looking at Spanish, but we would, just start to build out that data, put in here, you know, as many different layers as you want to, exclude males if you wanted to, save your, save the custom audience that you just created, and then start serving ads, either either across all sites that, that people visit while they're in Phoenix, or just specific sites. And you can white, you can whitelist, you know, the five best news sites or the five best health sites that have to do with Phoenix. Um, do you have tutorials on what kind of ad content works the best? Yeah, so I think that would be, you know, you would be in here and say, you might ask content questions and see um, where has been working the best for certain kinds of, of advertisers, or you might ask your, your support rep what's best. But I guess what's your, so you're, you're wondering what kind of sites do I want my ads to show up on? Well, no, like, um, should I have static ads? Should I do HTML5 ads? Like, are there pointers as to what my ads just themselves should look like if I'm completely brand new to advertising? Yeah, so we have a creative specification sheet that shows all the different sizes, um, most commonly used sizes, and um, some pointers on how best to create display ads. And you're exactly right, HTML5 with some, with some animation performs better because there's more of a call to action, more of a, an eye grabbing kind of thing. Very, very cool. I think that nails all the questions so, that have come in so far, but oh, please, please keep going. That's okay, I was just gonna wrap it up. So once we have our audiences, we would just start to create a campaign the platform itself makes it very easy to drop in creative. You can just drag and drop the creative that has already been made. We don't, we don't partner to help people make creative, but there are people out there that help you make creative. Once it's made, drop it in. Click here to create a new campaign. Tell it where you want the ads to serve, and that's it. And I'm keeping it high level because I don't want to get too in the weeds for people that aren't necessarily interested in building their own campaigns. Um, but when you sign on for Choosel, there's uh, about an hour worth of videos. There's about six different videos that you watch. We call it Choosel Academy. Once you complete that, you set up a call with a support rep who helps you build out and answer any questions about your first campaign. And then, of course, they're, they're there uh, to help support you as you run your campaign if you ever have any questions. Um, and if anyone's interested, um, I'll make my, my email address available to you all. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. We're happy to help. And I'm happy to set up a demo and answer any specific questions you guys might have. Cool. So a question just came in. Um, can you target across platforms, meaning the person hit the site and desktop? Uh, now I want to retarget them on mobile. Yes, and that's been a that's been a, a difficult thing in this space for a while because they're they're separate. Each person is kind of siloed in the eyes of the display exchanges which means if their device ID desktop shows up for a blue pair of shoes, then they go on their, their mobile device. They're kind of a whole new person looking at that same blue pair of shoes. They, they wouldn't be able to tie the two together. And so that creates one problem of not being able to track the person you wanna track. And the second problem is you can't track through that conversion. If they buy the, sh the shoes from their mobile device after researching them on their desktop, 
people are losing credit where credit is due. Um, so what we do for that is we partner with a company called Drawbridge. And Drawbridge connects those device IDs to say um, cross-device targeting and cross-device attribution. And because we're a platform of platforms, um, you don't have to have you know, one partner over here serving ads and then serve some of your ads over with Drawbridge. We can actually do that all under the same umbrella and help you track it all in the same place. Very cool. Uh, Clint, did you have anything that popped up that you were thinking about? Um, the managed campaigns for we, where you guys are doing it, do you have a minimum spend? Great question, and, and happy to get into more details if anyone has any questions. But level one, so on the whole, like we're this platform is available to anybody for $99 per month. If that self-service person, the person that, that gets in here and does you know whatever they want for $90 a month, if they start to spend $10,000 per month, they become a strategic account and they have direct uh, contact and direct support through a managed service um, account manager where they can call or email anytime for help. That same level, that $10,000 per month, is the minimum uh, the monthly minimum for managed services. So if, if they don't want to do it themselves, if they want us to, to, to pull the levers, then a $10,000 per month uh, spend would, would do that. Kind of a, a long way of answering that. Clint, did that make sense? Did that answer your question? Oh yeah, it made perfect sense. So. Cool. And it seems fair, you know, the idea of if you're under 10,000, <laughs> you need to do the work. But we'll be very supportive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah that, seems, that, seems, that seems remarkably fair. Yeah, we're there for in the support center for under 10 grand. We definitely don't, you know, set you up and walk away. We're there for help. And I, I guess it's worth mentioning here that to become a strategic account or to have support with platforms that are similar to, to Choosel, that typically starts at the 50, 60, 70, $100,000 per month for that level of support. Where would you recommend like a small agency guy like myself to go in the first time? What kind of budget would you recommend to start off? Sure. So that would be a great question for the support rep that you would be talking to after you go through the Choosel Academy. Mm -hmm. um, because we wouldn't recommend putting $100 against all females 18 to 34 you know, to, to get them interested in, in nutrition bars. But if you wanted to put $100 against, you know, a DMA to hit moms that drive Chevy whatevers and like milkshakes, then that niche audience is fine with a small spend. So, it's, it's you know, it's case by case, and we're happy to help um, get you there, you know, with support on that first on that first campaign. Would you say the more defined you are, the smaller the budget is okay? Because it's a drop in the bucket, $100 if you're hitting it nationwide. But if you're if you're defining your audience very niche, then it would be okay to to spend less on that because you're not trying to make a big bigger splash. Very very. But cool. niche also includes right. So just like Boise, Idaho, or a part of Boise, right? Niche plus very small. If you're niche but but a large nationwide audience, like you're looking to, to find IT managers interested in, in cloud storage, um, that's a niche audience, but it's a nationwide reach. So you know you'd still want to spend a healthy budget to try to hit those guys enough to get the point across. Okay, so that makes sense. So like, if I'm just targeting a city in a specific, like a really narrow narrow target base, then you can plan, you know, one to five hundred dollars would be okay. But if I want to go nationwide, then one, two, three, four thousand is probably a good plan. Sure, and we might even say, and it depends. You know, your your support rep would would have more information on this. She might even suggest more depending on the target. Okay. You know, Clint, I was also you know, when you think about a lot of our local clients. Uh, that's almost an advantage then because they would be targeting very specific zip codes, perhaps very specific areas of a city that right there becomes a very 
the, the narrowing audience, qualifier. Yeah. Right. The audience just got a lot smaller, so their spend is a lot less. Right. Mm -hmm. Which is probably where most of our clients are <laughs> looking at. I would love to squeeze a lot out of a hundred bucks. Right. But uh, right. Well, they wouldn't, they wouldn't want to oversaturate right. the small couples of codes. <laughs> I'm almost thinking also too of like trophy placements. Um, clients really love it when they see ads that might not be even the most well performing ads, but they see ads on places that they go. You know, they can they feel really proud to see that uh, if I if I wanted to do something like that where I could get into something super nice and, and my client has the opportunity to see it, are there ways I can kind of trophy placement uh, for smaller budgets? Yeah, I guess that's, that's a good question, right? Um, IP address comes to mind. Um, you wouldn't be able to do CRM just because CRM, like you can't just, and, and again, that, that same caveat exists. You wouldn't be able to just put one email address into the platform and then serve ads to that one email address, um, just because data matching it wouldn't work like that. But if you wanted to to hit an IP address of a, of a person or an entity that you know that you're you know serving, you can definitely put that IP address into the into the campaign and make sure that that IP address is seeing ads. We oftentimes do that in reverse for our campaign. So let's say we're working with I'll use the Microsoft example. If Microsoft doesn't want to waste ad dollars on their employees' eyeballs, then they will sure. use their IP address to anti-target the campaign. So, so that, that same mentality could work in the, in the reverse. Because I think, I can think of like, you know, the local plumber uh, targeting their IP and having them so they could see, hey, your ads are going across. Really huge and awesome <laughs> sites, I think. That turns into a client yeah. for life. Right. Look how much, how many ads are out there for you. It's all to him. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> He's the cool only math, one seeing. Coolmathgames.com. Yeah. <laughs> man, I've seen my ads everywhere. It's half of their spend. <laughs> yeah, man, we're killing it. So I, I uh, think we, I think I, you know, hopefully I, People on the call know a lot about search, obviously. I'm, I'm learning. Um, I wanted to show just an example here of where we are, what, what's, what's happening. So this ad unit right here is retargeting. Um, and anyone's ad that, that, that uses Choosel could show up here. Um, same goes for, for right here. This is a retargeting ad. Um, and, and these all, all these Ad inventory spaces used to be reserved for site direct only, but there's been a shift. Uh, CNN now has their best ad inventory right here on the open exchanges. Um, and I, I think we got that across, right, Kyle? I just wanted to kind of yeah, for sure. And, what programmatic and, and it's a, it's, it's cool. an amazing thing where you can get access to. I mean, there are a few eyeballs are going to go across these types of sites. That's right. If, if we all make it through the end of the year. Yeah, and just to get access to this kind of a, an audience is amazing. Agreed. Well, I'll hang on just for one second. Clint, if you have any more questions, please fire away. I'll hang on just for one second. If I, if you asked a question and you haven't heard the answer yet, I wasn't ignoring you. Please fire it again and, and we'll get it out. I just missed it. But I think I may have hit all the questions. Oh, Simon's what is the minimum... Yeah. yeah, what is the minimum number of emails you need to create an audience? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great uh, question. Um, I've seen, so we use a partner called LiveRamp to, to anonymize those emails for us and to put them into to cookie match. Um, it's about a 40 to 60% match rate, meaning uh, it's not a, you know, it's not a perfect one-to-one -one science, meaning if you give me a thousand email addresses, I'm not going to give you a thousand cookies because there's going to be a, a drop rate. There's going to be, you know, a match rate that, like I said, is about 40, 60%. So of those, you'd get four to 600. Um, I don't believe I've ever seen anyone provide us with less than a thousand emails. Um, so if anyone's interested in, in that, please let me know offline or shoot me an email and I can give you a, an exact answer. But I would say that, you know, a thousand would probably be the minimum. 
Sure. Did you cover, can you import the retargeting audiences out of Facebook and uh, AdWords? So can we, so can we take Facebook's data and put it in ours to retarget those people? No. Is that, is that the, I think I understand the question. Yeah, pretty much. Well, yeah, you, cause you use return okay. pixels on your site, send traffic and it builds that audience for you inside of Facebook for marketing down the road. But, uh, yeah. yeah. So what we're kind of restricted to is, is the, the site pixel that lives on, let's say you're working with smithshoes.com. The site pixel lives on smithshoes.com and any of their like white papers or landing pages that, that belong to that website, we can call here. So let's say it's Smith Shoes homepage, Smith Shoes, get more information, shopping cart, cart conversion. This is just a messy demo, so just ignore these, but this would be the breakout of each of those pages. And that's where we're kind of relegated to. We, we can't really go out to another platform like Facebook and grab that data, but we can grab the site data. Okay. Oh, very, very cool. Sequencing. Sequences is something I know people like to do on Facebook. So if you had a bunch of people click on your 160 by 600 e-commerce creative, we can pull that audience and say, okay, let's take this audience now and serve them the second, the second piece of our sequence. So they clicked on creative one. Now let's give them creative two by creating an audience and then building a campaign for that line item. Well, that's a lot of fun. You can almost move people through the funnel. Yeah. Like, okay, they've clicked on this ad, they've seen that landing page, now let's give them the next ad and the next landing page. That's right. So lots of options. Um, really appreciate the platform. I think um, there's a lot of opportunities to target and serve ads to an audience, and we make it as easy as possible. You know, the one thing that we didn't hit was the elephant in the room, and that's um, Choosel. Is that the great, the best name or the greatest name of all time? <laughs> you know, I, I guess we would say, you know, Google is not, not the coolest name either, but it kind of stuck. <laughs> Choosel, Choosel will work. We'll see. Once we start to add more partners in, you have to choose one there. I don't know. I haven't worked on a good uh, cheesy line unit of why that name doesn't suck, but but uh, it's a powerful platform, so I'll take it. <laughs> I um I always think of Ralph Wiggum, and that I chew chew choosel you for Valentine's Day cards, <laughs> or just a platform in general. Actually, I hope Choosel yeah. chooses me. I, I feel like this is a gift. You know, I, I look at the the power that this platform has, and just the ability that I could go in with a couple hundred bucks and actually do something really fun is pretty amazing. Yeah, I agree. I hope I was able to, to show you guys uh, that that's possible today. Um, happy to help. Like I said, ask for any questions. So feel free to reach out. We'll provide my email address, and, and I appreciate it. Yeah, how, how can how can people get in touch with you? Sure. So it's just Mark, M-A-R-K, at choosel.com, choo-choo-choosel.com. <laughs> um, Minus the two chews. Yeah. So there's the address there. I didn't really – put it anywhere, it's kind of leaving this uh, pretty open, but maybe some somewhere on the forum or, you know, and, and the, the webinar details, you can put mark at choosel.com. But if anyone's on the call right now, mark at choosel.com, my email address. Um, I head up the, the, the sales team here on the West Coast, but if you're anywhere else in the country, I'll be happy to introduce you to my East or Midwest counterpart, um, and, and they can take it from there to, to help answer any questions you have. One final question just came in, and it was about that AdWords has uh, bidding strategies to self-optimize. Um, I guess the question would be, if you are coming in as that self-managed person, maybe Choosel does that through the, the the first meeting that you have after you've gone through the academy. Would you say that that's kind of where then the the bidding strategies come from, or is there are there other places to get bidding strategies out of Choosel? That's a great question. That, that kind of speaks to programmatic advertising in general. So 
uh, we might think about talking to that support rep as you're creating your first campaign, how to ask them just general questions about how and where and, you know, what tools are the best to hit people for certain things. They can help with that and build a strategy out. And let's say you build a, let's say you build a retargeting campaign, hitting people in all of Idaho and your bids are set at one to five and you have a frequency cap of whatever in there. So that's some stuff you, you know, you got your support rep to give you that, that, that data to help you get that far. Um, but then when you think about so auto optimizing, so what is auto optimizing? Auto optimizing is having the machine do what's best for the campaign's performance. So if you're driving for clicks, you might set up the campaign to drive for CTR. If you're driving for conversions, the, the, the machine needs to know that this is the page that you're trying to drive people to. So if you built a lookalike audience, the machine understands that those people that have visited that page are the ones that we want to build our model off of. Uh, so the machine would also know that if this piece of creative, the 100 by by 650, whatever that the ad creative size is, has driven the most amount of clicks, then it's going to auto optimize to show that creative more than the other creative that it has to draw upon to help drive people to the site. So when I hear auto optimizations, typically auto optimizations is just meaning the machine will help the campaign perform better based on creatives, um, based on bidding on certain sites. So if, if we see a lot of conversions coming from Forbes, uh, the machine could probably understand that it wants to serve more ads in Forbes than it does on another site. And those things do happen automatically in the platform based on auto optimizations that are set in the system. Um, if those are turned off, then you might do that on your own. You might use this really large amount of data to try to do it yourself. Um, but we do have the ability to do that automatically. Um, and again, the support rep can kind of talk about how that works. You know, the other thing that I'd point out, and this is my opinion on how Google works, but Google isn't set up for you to succeed. Google is set up for you to be mediocre because they only have so much ad space and they want to sell that ad space, and they have more than 10 people bidding on, on certain things. So Google set up to keep you in the middle so that you'll not really crush it, but not do poor enough that you give up on advertising and you just continue to give them money. When you're de dealing with a third-party platform such as Choosel, Choosel actually has your best interest in mind. They really want you to crush it because then they really want to continue to keep you in the platform. And I think that's one of the larger differences between going with Google as, as your choice versus something like this as a third party, you, you'd still get access to the same sites. Google is set up in an easy way for you to lose money, to just to spend money. Uh, whereas Choosel or another kind of third party platform like this is really set up in a way to really help you succeed. That's what I think it may be one of the larger differences between just going with uh, Google suggestions versus what you might get out of Choosel. Very eloquently put. You, you should join us here at Chusel. <laughs> <laughs> Are you guys hiring? Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you have a guy that knows a lot about H1 tags? Do you need Do you need that as a, a position over there at Chusel? We need it. We need H1 tags, whatever those are. <laughs> um, the last question. Last last question. Um, can we speak to a support rep before committing to a paid plan? I guess the concern is. Um, so th we've seen a lot. We've seen a ton of data, a ton of information, and the crowd here is, I think, above average, but still um, there's a lot going on. Is it possible? I guess the concern is um, we don't have to commit a few hundred dollars before we actually can see if this is right for us, I guess is the question. Yeah, and I'm happy to be that first step. Um, I'm not going to try to sell you know, a self-serve thing for $100 a month that doesn't lead to anything. Uh, there's no there's no sense in that. Um, I'm happy to, to be that first step. And if you want to talk to a support rep, I'm happy to set up that call. But I think what typically what I've done here is the Choosel Academy is the first step to signing up. Typically, people will go to our site, sign up, and then go through Choosel Academy. 
and then talk to a support rep. What I think has been really helpful for a lot of my, my newer display agencies and display contacts here is skip that first sign-up step and give them access to the Chusel Academy. They can then, you know, watch the quick video about what we are, watch a quick video about the tag that we provide you with, watch the quick video about how to use the libraries and the data partners that we have, and then, you know, kind of see, is this something that they want to do as a self-serve platform? Do they want, you know, do they want to do the self-serve? Can they, is there somebody else out there that provides a managed service for less than 10K? I don't know. Good luck. But at least this is something that, that you can say, hey, I, I think I can do this. These videos make it look, you know, like I'm learning something and I want to give it a shot. And if after you watch the videos, you, you want to talk to a support rep, I'm happy to facilitate that. Very cool. And again, they can hit you at, what was your email address again? Mark at Chusel.com. That's easy enough. So, Mark, thank you so much for being on. I, I really appreciate your time. I really appreciate you walking through this. I think, you know, this was, I've been in the internet marketing industry for a long time, but this was a really new concept for me. And I appreciate uh, our chance meeting at SMX so we could have you on. I think this was fantastic. I agree. Thanks for having me on. I look forward to learning more about search and, and chatting with you guys here and there and putting together campaigns that that work for that feed into search. But if not, at least choose a, a way that people can can get on and, and perform display advertising with no contracts and no minimums. So thanks again, Kyle. And it's nice to meet you, Clint. Thanks for having me on today, everybody. Right on, right on. Thank you, Clint. Appreciate you as always. My pleasure. And uh, thank you, everyone, for all your questions. I really appreciate it. Uh, appreciate all the participation. Uh, if you have questions later, obviously Mark just gave out his, um, his info and we'll follow up with that as well.